rocket. Oh no. Alright, let's try that again. Like that. Okay. And when you exhale, then you're gonna be a little Filipino dude with tattoos yeah. playing this crazy reggae fill. You'll do it just like that. Just do it like that. <laughs> because I didn't want anything to come between the drum I was, the skin I was dealt, you know. I suppose it goes back to whatever year it was when I was about 24. I was in an accident, a car accident, and my best friend died. The thing with that is that we had just changed seats like about 30 miles or so before. So that kind of blew me out pretty good, you know? And I said, well, here was I, like, almost 25 years old, just doing the stuff that other people thought was the right thing for me to do. I used to be a Taliban, you know, come Mr. Taliban, Taliban banana, I was a Taliban. You know, stuff like that. And then I began wondering what I wanted to do. And then it came up that this was what I wanted to do. And I was passing through town. I went to look for one of my sisters one day. This guy was hanging around her, you know. He had a drum, and I didn't have one, so I took his shit. <laughs> you know, because I needed it more than he did. We're not living in the 60s in Jamaica, we're living in 2006 in New York City. So like, I wanted to reflect my, you know, it reflects my experience and the time we're in. The fact of the matter is the band started playing shows right after 9-11. I mean, it's like hard to like really want to take a uh, relaxed stance anymore. Dub is a weapon, I mean, is always the idea. I don't know why, I think that uh, it was, it's sort of a description of the music. You know, and I wanted it to be something that uh, made people dance and like have a good time at the show hard hitting, you know, and and somewhat aggressive, which maybe isn't the first thing people think of when they think of dub. I don't know, I'm hoping it's something new that we're doing as opposed to a retread of what has happened. The first time I saw a real Cuban band, you know, I nearly wet my pants cause I realized that what I was trying to play was being played by a conga player, a bongo player, a timbali player, a guy who's playing maracas. I was listening to the whole thing and trying to play that. But by then, my little unorthodox stuff was getting a little traction. I didn't want to have to go back to square one. Yeah. So I just pressed on. No, I haven't yet built my first drum. Oh, yeah? No. Yeah. I want to put human skin on it. <laughs> I know, I know. The last time I saw you was with Gil Scott Herring at the uh, music school. Yeah, it was you and him, and you and him. Yeah, it was just me and him. Yeah, how you doing, man? Somebody will come to save America, especially in B movies. I met Gil because. I had done a reggae album in a studio that was owned by his engineer and producer. After I, did, after I did the album, he asked me to join him on a tour behind the album on that. That run lasted like 21 years. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about your 
I'm not good with years, but I haven't seen Gil since 2002. It was cool. Yeah. Me and him had little differences towards the end, but hey, shit happens. Shit know? happens, yeah. I just always wanted to do this kind of record, a dub record, and when I had a place to do it in Brooklyn, in this loft I lived in, I did it. I met Larry like in probably 1995 or 96. Well, Gil and I had just parted ways. And I don't think I really had an intention to do live performances at first. We were both playing with the David Haley at Rock 37, that's where I met him. I guess at first Larry seemed a little skeptical, but eventually he seemed to really like us. I liked how he played and, you know, we was cool. Well, I had this idea to do a dub record and he was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I really want to do that. Just sort of started writing music and, and getting it on tape. I didn't want to be like, put together just another good reggae band. This idea, like, just blew me away. Yeah. We rehearsed, you know, got people together and in various combinations, you know, winnowed it down to who you see now. And I said, look, if you can figure out a way to get it on the road and can get somebody to book it, call me. <laughs> myself the dub organizer because I'm not just twisting knobs and adding effects I'm also getting people to cut in and out and stuff like that when you're the engineer in the studio and you want to dub it out you can always decide what instruments to have in and which ones to have out and I guess I've over time developed a system of cueing the band members to achieve a similar effect you know I'm kind of just standing up there staring at my board and like listening you know the band seems to I guess they seem to trust me <laughs> I hate to think of it as being too totalitarian. I think everyone realizes we're kind of working together to make this greater good. I'm, I'm just trying to make great music, so I'm, you know, that's my main concern. <laughs> what I like about this band is that I can play as much or as little as I want. They give me that license. And Larry probably has the most freedom to kind of do whatever he wants. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of nice, I mean, because we're playing it. Everyone else is holding down this solid foundation and he sort of gets to play over that. I can take pretty much whatever liberties I want. He has a talent to sort of be able to do whatever he wants, you know. I've worked with other people who are, you know, who I would just be like, just do this. <laughs> So we were like the early show. I mean, the place was practically empty for us. Seven people in the club, you know, three of them worked there. But we was there and we was set up. So we just said, shit, you know, let's play. We just went up and spat out two kick-ass sets, you know. I mean, we was just, we was crushing. A couple of months later, they got a call from Lee Perry's then road manager, who happened to be one, oh, yeah. one of the few people in the club in Jacksonville, you know, uh, which goes, to sh which, you know, it just proves the old story. Look, if you get up there, burn. <laughs> Finding out if they got them on the West Coast when we go out that way Sunday. Like... 